and rolling. The easiest way to get the big budget look you want for your music video is by shooting off speed. That means either shooting at a faster or a slower frame rate than the frame rate you're going to deliver the finished clip in. Shooting in slow motion can give your footage a dreamy cinematic quality, whereas shooting in fast motion can make things seem frenetic and add energy. The tricky part is how you keep your musicians in sync with the underlying soundtrack. So for the slow motion effect, you get your artists to perform to a version of the song that's been sped up. And conversely, for the fast motion effect, they perform to a version that's been slowed down. This can be a whole lot of fun until you get into post-production, where you can chew up literally days, manually syncing every take to the underlying song. And a lot of first-time filmmakers will still put scratch microphones on the camera so that they can hear the playback that was happening on set and use that as a way to synchronize the footage. This is not only excruciating, it can also really limit your options because a lot of cameras don't record sound when they're shooting off speed. Now you can save yourself a world of hurt and streamline the shoot and the edit by creating your own visual timecode slate that you hold up in front of the camera before every take. All you need is a tablet, a wireless audio transmission kit, and some kind of a speaker system like this one <clears throat> so the band can hear the take. You can see there I've got a little wireless receiver bolted to the top of it. If you set things up correctly, you'll be able to shoot a variety of frame rates, choose any part of the song that you want to focus on for a particular take without having to always start from the beginning, and in post, you'll be able to sync up your footage with just a couple of clicks perfectly every time. Today I'm going to demonstrate how these work in practice, then I'm going to jump back to the old edit suite and show you how to make one of these slates from scratch, and at the end, I'm going to show you a surprise technique that's guaranteed to make you lose your shit. Now this next part might seem a little bit like eating dessert before mains, but I thought it would be a little more interesting to see the effect in practice before we get into the nuts and bolts of the editing and maybe even some light math. So if you're familiar with the results you can get from shooting off speed on music videos and you want to avoid some cringe-worthy lip syncing, feel free to use the chapter markers to jump ahead to the section on post-production. Now, for the purposes of this demonstration, I've chosen a wonderful piece of royalty-free production music. Uh, it's a 90s hip-hop track called Do What I Do. And I'd say it's kind of in the style of Big L or Gangstar. And look, real talk, this is gonna be awkward as f Pale nerds rapping has only ever worked once in history and clearly I am no beastie boy. So I'm gonna kindly ask that you all put your judgment aside and look past this dorky exterior to find the rich vein of educational value within. I'm going to shoot three versions and then composite them together into a single shot so you can see the effect at work. Now it's important to remember when you're choosing a frame rate for your music video that it can be dependent on a few key factors, mainly the style of the music that you're shooting and also the tempo of the song. If you're shooting overcranked, a particular consideration will be how fast the artist can accurately perform the song. I'll normally send samples to the band in advance or at least turn up to set with a number of different options just in case my plan A is too fast for them. Here in Australia, we're lucky enough to be shooting on a base rate of 25 frames a second, which makes the maths way easier. We'll get into that a bit later on. The frame rate I shoot the most on music videos is 35 frames a second because I find it still provides a noticeable effect, but it's not so fast that the artist will miss their lip sync. For today's demo, we'll go to either extreme. I'll shoot a version at 25 frames a second, it's kind of like our control group, then we'll overcrank to 50 frames a second and undercrank to 15 frames a second. And I'll be wildly gesticulating throughout in order to show off the speed change effect. Please rest assured that in no way do I think I look cool while I'm doing that. So, here goes nothing. I'm using my Red Monstro shooting 7K with an Atlas Orion 40mm lens. It's currently sitting on my cam block motion control unit. We're not going to use that for this shot, but just you wait till later on. I've got a Teradek transmitter built into the Monstro, which is sending to an Atomos Sumo so that I can record the live monitor output, and that gives you a chance to see the settings as they change. One quick little tip if you're ever planning to composite different frame rates into the one shot is it's really going to help you later on if your exposure doesn't shift between frame rates. The way to avoid that is to lock your shutter speed to the highest frame rate you think you're going to shoot. In this case, I'm going to shoot 50 frames a second, will be the fastest, so I'm going to set my shutter to 1 one hundredth of a second, which is 180 degrees of that. But by changing the shutter speed mode from relative to absolute, or in other words, from degrees to fractions, it means that when I change from 50 frames and further on down, that shutter speed is always going to stay at 1 100th of a second and the exposure shouldn't shift. Okay, enough preamble. 
Let's get this over with. Here's my iPad with VLC loaded. I find VLC a lot more usable for this purpose than Apple's default video player. I've got the three tracks set up here in order to subject you to the smallest amount of pale nerd air wrapping as possible. I'm just going to do the chorus. So what we'll do is we'll wind this back to just before the chorus into the end of verse one. So that we get a little bit of run up into the track. All right, everyone, here we go. <laughs> Well, that was awkward. Now it's time for our 50 frames per second version. So I'll change the setting on the Monstro, shift over to that side of the frame and see whether I can get within cooey of nailing these lyrics at double speed. Now, the reason for all this nonsense in front of me is I've actually got a tablet that's controlling my motion control and an iPad mini that's running full control to control the Monstro. So I can just jump straight in here and ramp this up to 50 frames a second. And you'll see because we got our shutter speed locked, the exposure didn't change. Okay, so we've got our 50 frames per second version loaded up in the iPad here. We're gonna run it back to roughly the same starting point we did before in the end of verse one, and maybe give it a little bit more of a run up because the track's gonna be running twice as fast this time. All right, this is gonna be super awkward, so let's give it a crack. <laughs> Okay, well, as you can tell from my jerky persona, we changed the Monstro to 15 frames per second and pulled up the matching playback track on the iPad. Gonna run it pretty much from the end of verse one because this is gonna be really slow and painful. I'm actually gonna take my glasses off just to be really serious on this one. All right, let's do it. <laughs> All right, well done everyone for getting through that. Uh, now it's time to throw it all in the computer and see how it came out. Okay, so I've got the 7K R3D files from the Monstro imported into the brand spanking new M1 Max MacBook Pro, fully loaded. I've uh, got a couple of nice uh, LG 48CX screens here that I'm running. Um, we can talk more about that in another episode if anyone's interested to find out about the performance, but so far it's an absolute screamer. Uh, now to sync this up to the underlying track, uh, you'll see here in the timeline, I've started with my 25 frames a second, I guess you'd call it a master slate or a base slate. We'll talk about how to create that from scratch later on. Now to sync up these takes that we did to the underlying song, it's pretty simple. All you have to do is click on the clip here to sort of load it up into your player. And then I'm gonna to scrub to, I'm just gonna find the last take that I did and then just track down where the time code was visible. So you, you, all you wanna do is be able to see a clear shot of the slate um, and actually make sure that the time code is moving. So you wanna make sure that the operator actually pushed play um, and it's underway. So 10409, I can see nice and clearly there. I'm gonna push the I key to set an in point. Then one really quick way I like to make this work is just to click down here in the timeline, hit control P and hit, just type in 10409, which was that time code we found on the iPad and hit enter. That's going to jump me to that exact point in the timeline. And if I hit the Q key, it's going to drop that take directly down onto the timeline. Now, if I play that back, you can see the lip syncs pretty well right there. What a wanker. So that's how simple it is to sync up the clip. So I'll just quickly take you through that with some of the others so you can see the off-speed versions in action. So again, we'll click on this next take here, scrub to the end, find wherever we brought up the slate. There it is. So I'm just going to hold down the right arrow to scrub through. You can use shift right arrow if you need to sort of jump ahead. Obviously, I didn't do a great job avoiding the reflections there, but I could just see I've got 59.15 there. Again, I'm gonna hit the I key. Now, if you don't wanna use that time code shortcut I used before where you type in the time code, you could just scrub through till you find 59.15 on your timeline here, you know, back a bit. There it is, hit Q and then so even though that was a 50 frames, you can see there that the sync's working. Do the same thing again now with the 15 frames a second version. So we'll click on that one, go to the end and find the point where the time code was moving. I was pretty quick on that one, but it should just be a moment there. There we go, 105.19. So again, hit the I key, click down here, control P, 105.19, enter, Q. And just like that, you can see the lip syncs working. Wow, that's pretty wanky. Now, 
In terms of setting this up for a really rough composite, obviously we're not going to finesse this too much um, because it's just for educational purposes at the moment. All you got to do is basically grab the shape mask tool in Final Cut and there'd be similar ones in other NLEs that I'm sure you're all familiar with. So I'm going to click down here in my effects window. I'm going to type in shape and there's shape mask. Double click on that one and you'll see I get this little shape here. I'm just going to stretch that up. Oh, one thing I will do just for the sake of making it look clean is I'm just going to drop the opacity of the underlying time code layer just so that that's not cluttering things up. So I've got a, there's a default feather on that, which will be handy for now. So I'm just going to move that over my 15 frames a second version. And then I can basically just cut, copy and paste that to the other two. So I'm just hitting Command Shift V there and you can see Shape Mask, paste it in. Now, if I click on this version here, I can just drag it across to find my 50 frames version over there. And then I click on my base layer here, which was a 25 move that across and we don't really need a mask on the bottom layer but um, you know it's there just in case we want to put anything else behind it and now m1 max three layers of 7k r3d files in a 1080p project at the moment let's see how it goes playing it straight back with a rough composite i just do what i do It's not bad for a laptop. Now you can see one little th glaring issue here is that I forgot to turn off my gratuitous anamorphic flare in the background. So our 15 frames a second dickhead on the right hand side is chopping in and out of the flare, which means we're getting this kind of um, semi-illuminated section in the top end of the frame where it's a little darker than it should be in the rest of the takes. And that's making for an obvious cut. So if I had my time again, for starters, I'd probably do a bit better job of positioning myself in the frame and I'd definitely turn that light off. But for the sake of something fun, just to see how these frame rates work next to each other, you can see that the, the technique's working pretty well. We were able to sync our takes with just a couple of clicks and they're all working nicely next to each other. And the fact that the M1 Max can play back in real time without rendering three layers of 7K R3D is pretty bloody impressive. Okay, well, even though that's a really rough composite, you can see the technique works, leaving aside the whole nerdiness of mixing three different frame rates into one shot. You can see that using these visual timecode slates on your music video takes means in post, it's a really reliable couple of clicks process and you know that it's gonna be accurate every time. It's all about the six Ps, prior preparation prevents piss poor performance. So now why don't we rewind back a bit and I'll show you how to make these slates from scratch. So I'm in a clean project here and I've got the music track loaded in. All we want to do is create a new project at 1080p. It's really crucial here that when it comes to the frame rate of this project, you select the delivery frame rate that the final clip will be delivered in. If you're working with a music label, they might provide you with a sheet of delivery specs. You really want to make sure you get those before the shoot starts rather than partway through principal photography or even worse, once you're into the edit. So this is really the point of no return. You want to make sure you get this right the first time. We'll call this do what I do. 25 FPS, and this is going to be effectively a master slate for our whole playback project. Now I'm going to grab the music track and simply hit the W key to drop that into the timeline. The first thing I'm going to do is add some space at the front. You've got to think about the practicalities of your shoot. You want the playback operator who's running the iPad for you to have enough time to get in front of the cameras, get a clean shot, push play, see the time code rolling, and then get out of the way and your camera operators and focus pullers still have enough time to frame their shot up and pull focus before the music actually starts. That's why a bit of a gap at the start's important. Have a think about the practicalities of your shoot. If you've got something complex like pyrotechnics or some crazy choreography, you might want a fairly sizable gap. I've found generally that about 10 seconds is worthwhile. Easiest way to put a gap in there is to add what's often called a slug. In Final Cut, it's referred to as a gap. So I'm gonna hit the home key to jump to the top of the timeline and then hit option W to insert a gap. I'm gonna click on the gap, hit control D and then type in 10, 0, 0, 0, and hit enter, and that's gonna make it a 10 second gap. Now I'm gonna add another gap at the end. This can be super handy in certain situations in a music video where you haven't, for whatever reason, been able to get the time code in front of the cameras at the start of the take. You've then got plenty of time at the end for that operator, as long as they keep the iPad rolling, to run in front of the cameras and grab what most people would refer to as a tail slate. I've found this is most useful when I'm doing drone shots, where I'd much rather be able to put the drone in the air and get it set up ready for the shot at the beginning and then once the take's finished quickly fly the drone over to wherever the playback operator is and have them hold it up in front of the camera same process again we'll hit the end key to jump to the end of the timeline option w to add a gap click on the gap 
control D and then go three zero 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 and we've got ourselves a 30 second gap. Okay, so now that we've locked the overall duration of our timeline, it's time for the most important step and that's adding a time code generator. Now, depending on the software you're using, it might call it something different. Today I'm editing in Final Cut. I know this is all possible in Resolve. I'm sure it's possible in Adobe Premiere as long as you're okay with the project crashing 50 to 60 times throughout and leading you to question your life choices. So what we need to do is jump into the titles and generator section, click on generators, hit the search box, start typing in time code and you'll see that one pop up there. Click on it jump to the head of your timeline and hit Q to drop it on top of the music track. We'll stretch it out to fill the length of our timeline. And now it's time to tweak some settings. So click on the generator and jump up here to the inspector panel. First thing to do, get rid of this label that says project, no need for that. Uh, then you can choose a font. Now, if graphic design is your passion, you can really go nuts with this entire layout. Uh, maybe the band's got a favorite font they want. It really doesn't matter that much. I mean, these slates usually get caught in some behind the scenes footage. It might get seen in some social media posts. So, you know, you want it to look professional, but the most important thing is readability. I tend to choose a bold condensed font. That way the time code is really visible, particularly if the camera operator didn't quite get focus sharp on the, on the tablet, you can still see it. And the condensed font means that you can scale it up a little bigger and make it fill the screen. So one that I like to use here, I've got uh, Helvetica New LT Pro. We'll just change that to bold. And now it's time to scale it up. Oh, before we do that, just a couple of settings that are really important to check. They're good by default in Final Cut, but not necessarily in other software. The most important thing is to make sure that frames are visible in the time code. So you can see up here, it says the format is HMSF or hours, minutes, seconds, frames. So we're all good there. Uh, the other thing to make sure is the frame rate's correct. By default, it's just gonna match whatever my project is. And as long as I was careful to choose my music video delivery frame rate, then that's all gonna be good. But you, depending on your software, you may have to specify the correct time code here. And that's really important to get right the first time. So now let's scale up our time code. The goal is to make it fill as much of the width as, of the screen as possible with a little bit of a buffer on each side. One thing that I tend to do is get rid of the hours section, let that fall off the screen. If you're doing a music video that's longer than an hour, I'd really offer you my condolences. Mostly you'll be doing clips between two to five minutes. So we don't need that hours section. We'll just shift that across until it kind of falls off. We can even go a little bigger here. If you want to be anal retentive, you could turn on your title safe zones and use that as kind of a margin to fit all your important content within. Now what we're going to do is start adding some labels. So I like to put the artist and the track on there just in case I'm producing multiple music videos at the same time. I don't want to play the wrong song to the wrong band. So now that we've got our title set and we've kind of started using a certain kind of formatting, rather than reinventing the wheel every time, let's just start duplicating our title assets. So if you hold down the option key and drag upwards, you'll create a duplicate of that title. And what I'm gonna do now is start creating some labels for each section of the song. This could be super helpful when you're on set, rather than having to run the song from the top every time, you just might wanna do a retake where you just focus on the chorus or focus on a drum solo or something like that. And if you've got those moments all clearly labeled on your slate, you're gonna be able to tell the operator exactly what you want. You'll say, hey, let's jump to the chorus and then just run it back a little bit and they'll sort of take it back into the previous verse to give you a bit of a run up. So now that we've got all the sections of the song labeled, the last label we wanna add tells us what frames per second this slate is based on. So again, we're just going to duplicate one of our titles here, drag it out to fill the width and send it up to the top corner. We'll put in 25 FPS. Let's chuck that up here. Now, before we export it, there's one little step that I like to take that I won't take you all the way through because it's a bit time consuming, but I like to put a metronome at the beginning using a series of audio pips so that the band can get the rhythm in their head before the song starts. That way at the beginning of the take, there's no sort of lip sync issues or performance errors. So now that you've got your pips in place, you're ready to export this out. So I'm gonna hit Command E to bring up the export dialog, jump straight across to the settings. I'm gonna make sure the video codec set to H.264. That way this is gonna be ready to drop straight onto a tablet and it'll be compatible. So we'll export this one out to our playback folder. Do what I do, 25 frames a second. So now that we've got our master slate created and exported, we're gonna bring it back in and use that as the basis for all of our off-speed versions. So you can see I've imported the clip that we just created, and now I'm gonna create a new project, or it would be called a sequence or a timeline in other software. I'm gonna call this one 
do what I do, 50 FPS. Now it's important to make sure that the frame rate of this sequence project timeline, whatever you want to call it, is the same as the delivery frame rate again. We don't want this to be 50 FPS, we want it to stay as 25 FPS. So we'll create that sequence. Now we're going to click on the master slate that we created, hit the W button to drop that down to the timeline. And now it's time for a little bit of maths. So here's the simple formula you need to remember whenever you're trying to work out how to create an off-speed music video slate. So you wanna take the frame rate that you wanna shoot at, divide it by your base or delivery frame rate, and then times that by 100. And that's gonna give you the percentage of speed change that you need to apply to the clip. So in this case, we'll jump over to a calculator here. We want this to be a 50 frames per second performance take. So we're gonna go 50 divided by 25, which is our base rate, equals two. And then we're gonna times that by 100 equals 200. Obviously in this situation here in Australia at 25 frames base rate, Making it 50 is pretty simple. We're pretty much speeding it up by double. If you're shooting in the United States on one of your weird ass frame rates like 2997 or 2398, this technique still works. You just need to be ready to do some rounding when you get to the final step. So what we're gonna do now is click on the clip and go control option R to bring up our custom speed change. And we're gonna drop in 200% and you'll see there the clip halves in duration effectively. Now, one of the nice things about modern NLEs is that these days they take care of correcting the pitch for you when you apply speed changes. As you can see, we've doubled the speed. So without a pitch correction, this would sound like Alvin and the Chipmunks. but the software takes care of that for you. Back in the Final Cut 7 days, I used to have to put a third party plugin on there and try to match the pitch manually. So now we've got our 50 frames per second version. So if we do a little playback, you can hear it's pretty fast. And down at the start, we can hear our pips coming in. So it's really useful in this situation if you're playing an unexpected speed to a band that they can get that beat in their head before the song actually starts. So we're almost ready to export, but you might notice one glaring issue and that's this thing still says 25 frames a second. So there's a couple of ways to attack this. My method that I've found the most easy is just to grab the old mask tool again, the one we used in our rough composite before. We're gonna shove that on there, scale it down, position it over the 25 frames, and then we're just gonna check this invert mask box. And you'll see there that we've gotten rid of the 25 frames. Then the easiest thing to do is just jump back to your master slate project, grab the 25 frames title that you used there, jump back to your 50 frames project, paste it in, trim the length so that it's the length of the timeline. And then all you have to do is just click on it, change the properties to, to read 50 FPS and you're ready to export. So we'll do the same thing now quickly for the 15 frames a second version. Easiest way to do it is just to duplicate. I'm gonna go Command D after I've clicked on my 50 frames project. And then I'll just change the name here to 15 frames per second. Really crucial in Final Cut, something I always forget to do is double click on that because by default it won't load that duplicated timeline up and you'll end up with your file names reversed. So now we're inside our 15 frames a second version. Again, let's jump back to our equation. Shooting frame rate divided by base frame rate times 100. So we'll jump to our calculator here and we're going to go 15 divided by 25 equals 0.6 times 100 equals 60%. That's the speed change that we want to apply. So again, we'll click on the clip here, go control option R, type in 60, and you'll see our sequence just got a whole lot longer. If you have a quick listen to the playback, super slow and boring, just like we had before. We've already got our title sitting here because we'd set that up previously in our 50 frames version. We'll click on the title asset, change it to 15 frames a second, and we're ready to export. Once you've got your tracks exported, it's time to put them on your tablet. Don't mess around with something like iTunes Sync. It can be a really fiddly way of doing it. VLC has a transfer mechanism built into it. So all you have to do is go down to the network tab down the bottom and you wanna make sure that sharing via Wi-Fi, there's a little selector here that you can turn that on and it's gonna tell you an IP address. All you have to do is open up a browser, type in that IP address, drag and drop the files into the interface that appears and those will transfer straight onto the iPad and you're ready to go. Okay, so I'm using a first generation iPad Pro 12.9 inch and I got this really handy little weatherproof case for it. On the back, I've just used a little piece of Velcro there to attach this Sony wireless um, 
digital audio transmitter. These are really good. They've got plenty of range and they've also got a little auto scan frequency where if you're in a location with a whole lot of wireless activity, they'll scan through the frequencies and find an open one for you. And then for the speaker, the one I like to use is this Bose S1 Pro. It cranks out heaps of volume. It's got a built-in battery so you can use it for a few hours if you're on a location away from power. And I just clamped the little Sony receiver on top there. The reason why you need plenty of volume with these things is because bands can kick out a lot of volume even when they're just pretending, especially if there's a drummer. Often I'll ask the drummer for certain takes if the angle is right to put some rubber drum pads or some fabric or something on his skins and even put bits of gaff tape on the cymbals just to reduce the sound a little bit. Not all drummers are going to be okay with that. Some of them are pretty particular about how authentic it's going to look. That's fair enough. Um, and even if you're shooting certain angles, you're going to have to take that stuff off anyway, otherwise, otherwise people will see it on the drums. Uh, if you've got the budget and the skills to do it, you can even go to the lengths of providing in-ear monitors to the drummer. That way you can really ride the beat the whole time and you don't have to run your main playback speaker for the rest of the band at quite as high of a volume. And this playback system can be leveled up infinitely. I've gone as far as asking labels for stems of a track. Stems are like isolated tracks of each individual instrument. And then we've built our own Rubens tubes, which are like flame bars that respond to sound waves and hook the playback system up to an Ableton Live session so that when we triggered it, it actually sent each individual stem to its own Rubens tube so that everything was bouncing to its own individual sonic frequency. Now, when it comes to the wireless system that you've got between your tablet and the speaker system, you really want to think about range. If you're planning a really nice wide shot, you're going to need the tablet close to the camera and then the speaker system all the way close to the band. So you want to make sure that your wireless system can cope with the range of that. If you're not planning to shoot over long distances, then you probably don't need a super expensive audio link. Uh, for the money, these little Rode Wireless Go 2s are pretty incredible. Battery lasts a fair while and they're super light and small, so easy to Velcro or attach onto the back of a tablet. You you might be tempted to use Bluetooth if your speaker supports it. Please don't. Most Bluetooth connections have an inherent delay and that delay is often inconsistent from take to take. It'll make your life an absolute nightmare in post. So if your tablet doesn't have a headphone jack, you might need to get yourself one of these little dongles like a lightning to 3.5 mil or a USB-C to 3.5 mil that'll give you the connection that you need. If you're shooting outside in bright sun or even indoors under bright lighting, you want to make sure that your tablet's bright enough to be visible on camera and make sure that your playback operator is conscious of things like reflections. So you can see there, I'm catching a nasty one from my key light there. So it's really up to your camera operator to communicate with your playback operator to tell them when they've got a readable slate and at that point they're free to press play and get the take started. Now one final but really important point on frame rates. When I've been talking about shooting off speed in this tutorial, I'm talking about something that's sometimes referred to as very speed, depending on the camera that you're working with. On Canon cameras, for instance, it's called slow and fast mode or S and F. On Sony's, it's S and Q or slow and quick mode. What it means is any mode where you're able to change the shooting frame rate without changing the underlying base frame rate. Basically, if you can play your clip back and in camera and see the slow motion or fast motion effect right there and then, then you've got a very speed camera. If you're using something like a DSLR that doesn't have very speed, but it can get up to something like 50 frames or 60 frames a second as a base rate, you can still use this technique. You just have to be really conscious that there'll be some extra maths to do in post to get that clip to the correct speed before you attempt to synchronize it. Now, I promise you there'd be a little surprise at the end, and that means it's time to bring some motion control into the equation. If you haven't heard that term before, motion control basically refers to any system that can move your camera in a perfectly repeatable fashion. And the good ones open up the possibilities of what's called multi-pass motion control, where you might have seen music videos where the same character appears in multiple parts of the frame, even though the camera's moving. And then you can level that up again by scaling those moves so that there can be mixed frame rates all in the same shot. Now it's hard enough to do that under normal circumstances, but then if you add the variable of lip sync to it, it gets really difficult. Fortunately, the unit I'm using today is my trusty CamBlock Adventure, and it has a built-in module that makes this extremely easy. In fact, even easier than all the crap we just did before. Basically what it can do, and you'll see the controller I've got here, is if I tab across here to this other section, you'll see it's got a VLC media playback module. Now what that can do, if you've got a laptop that's on the same Wi-Fi network that's running VLC and it's got your media clip loaded, 
This motion control software can trigger whatever media is in BLC at the time and trigger it at exactly the same point every time it runs the move. Because it's all well and good to have your move perfectly repeatable, but if the music's not happening at exactly the same time every move, you're never gonna be able to composite those shots together. And what makes this system ridiculously good is this little checkbox down the bottom here, scale with timeline. Basically what that means is that it's going to tell VLC to change the speed of that track to match the speed that you've set on the move, which means you don't have to load in all your different versions of your off-speed frame rates. VLC and cam block are gonna take care of scaling it all for you. So without further ado, let's see it in action with a little more pale nerd air wrapping. So we've got our 25 frames a second version loaded into this laptop here, and that's currently on the same Wi-Fi network as the cam block and this tablet controller. Uh, I've set it to start that media at one minute and five seconds, which is just that little bit of the end of verse one. It means you don't even have to trim your media to a certain section. You can just tell the software to start it at whatever point you want for the particular set of multi-passes that you're gonna do. So what we're gonna do here, I've set a little move, so I'm gonna send the camera back to ones over here, which is gonna pick up eventually our 15 frames a second dickhead. Okay, and let's have a crack at it. So without further ado, let's take it back to ones change the frame rate to 50 frames a second and we're going to scale our move to be half the length we've got it rolling and we're going to get in position for our very fast double speed take here we go and this one we need to do a little bit of reverse maths for so we're going to go Take this back to 1.666 recurring set. Okay, let's get it ready. Shift across to our 15 frames position, and here we go. Wanker! All right, so let's have a crack at compositing that together and we'll see what we get. Before mom and dad had me and was best friends I chew to cop, don't test them I, I chew on trash cause after that I bless them huh. I just do what I do huh. You see me? I just do what I do huh. I just do what I do I don't know about you I just do what I do Check I just do what I do you see me? I just do what I do huh. Feel me? I just do what I do I don't know about you I just do what I do huh. Well, that's it for today's episode, and hey, look who's back. It's the gratuitous anamorphic flare. I turned it off before when we were doing that multi-pass because as nice as a flare is, it can really mess with your compositing. I hope today's technique really helps you out and streamlines your shoots and your edits when it comes to music videos. It can open up loads of creative possibilities. I've done some crazy stuff like speed ramp changes within a single shot clip that keep the lip sync perfectly in check. I've uh, used 10 sequentially decreasing frame rates to make an artist move progressively further down a dystopian alleyway. Loads of possibilities. If you like the content, as always, appreciate your support. You know the drill. Like, subscribe, hit that bell. And if you like this motion control rig, head to facebook.com slash camblock. I reckon the guy who invented it is like a low-key genius and he's semi-retired. So if we can show him some support, we might be able to get those guys innovating again because I reckon nobody does it like this. And otherwise, I just want to wish you all happy hunting in the fertile grounds of content creation. I don't know about you, I just do what I do. Uh -huh.